All right, you guys, this is Ross. Today we're gonna talk about jujubes. I actually have a number of jujubes here that I've harvested off of my lee tree. We are one day away from frost. Um, so I figured this would be a really great time to harvest, make this last little video before the season ends. And I would talk to you guys about some of the jujube varieties that you might be interested in growing, at least that are definitely accessible at a lot of mail order nurseries that we can purchase these trees from. I will also, I think this year, be selling cuttings from my trees uh, because there has been some interest and it's been a while since I've sold some cuttings from these trees. Um, I do want to talk about some of the differences about them. Uh, so we have the sugar cane here that we planted. Uh, this is their second year in the ground. This is on the left in the video here, guys. And then behind me in the back corner um, is the Lee jujube. So that's what this is right here. It produces fruits, guys, I'm not kidding, that are the size of golf balls. And uh, my first couple years of getting it from a mail order nursery, I kept it in a container. And actually keeping it in a container, it was a, a very productive tree. Uh, but over the last couple years, it really hasn't been that productive. So I decided uh, maybe it's the container, maybe the fact it's been in a container for so long, uh, it's just getting too old. It doesn't like that environment anymore. Let's plant it in the ground. And that's what I did with both of these trees. They just weren't that productive for me in a container. And uh, some of the thoughts on that really revolve around sunlight. You know, is it that maybe just these two varieties are more well adapted to an area that gets more sunlight? Um, if that's the case, this area doesn't get a ton of light. And therefore I haven't really seen the production I think I should from these trees, especially how big they are and how well dug they in are, they are in now uh, in these locations. They were in 10 gallon size pots and they, were, you know, they have great root systems to them. They've really taken away this year. So maybe next year I'll see the uh, production that I should. But if not, I think it just really is a testament to choosing the right variety. And that's kind of why I'm making this, this video for you guys. So Lee produces these large fruits and typically in high quantity. Um, if you have the right environment. You know, people down in the south typically won't have to worry about it. But us further up north, it seems like some people struggle getting the sunlight they need, getting the pollination even perhaps. Uh, but you know, if you're in like the desert or more of a native client, cl uh, climate for these trees, they're gonna do really well. And what's nice about Lee is it produces the largest fruit, or at least typically you might see that Lang is gonna produce a larger fruit. But Lang requires a pollinator, and I never had great success with growing Lang uh, because it just never pollinated. And I had them right next to the trees. Uh, these I've noticed since I've planted them in the ground continually bloom, continually have flowers. Uh, and the first few fruits of the year, lower down on the tree, the first few, uh, few flowers, I'm sorry, never got pollinated. And it wasn't until they kept growing and kept flowering that later in the season where they actually pollinated. Now I'm getting the fruits at the very, very end of my season. Whereas typically this will be like a late summer fruit. It's ripening probably sometime in September and then into the fall. And uh, you know, this is just very late this time of year as we're one day away, we're in November uh, from our frost. So um, it is what it is. I'm getting them, I'm harvesting them. I got a whole handful here in my pocket of Lee. I've been eating the sugar cane. You know, every time I come out here and just pass by this area, I'll harvest some, I'll eat some. Um, but Lee is really, because it's so large, it's meant for drying. It's not really meant for that fresh eating. So when they turn, you know, red like this on the outside, that's what you look for when they start to turn more ripe. And then once they turn fully red and they get a darker color, then they start to shrivel and they'll turn into a dried fruit. And then from there, you know, you can have these guys all winter. They last so long in your house, uh, in storage, whatever, uh, as a dried fruit. They're actually really tasty, if you ask me. And I found that growing a number of different varieties now for quite a few years and, and trialing, trying them in different ways, you know, eating them in different stages, eating them when they're really ripe uh, and dried, eating, eating them when they're fresh and crisp like this, like an apple. I just find that Lee is just not the greatest fresh, right? 
you know, biting into that, it's good, but you know, really to me, it should be something a bit sweeter because sugar cane and honey jar are just significantly sweeter fruits. And they're really a better fresh eating experience. I think honey jar is just the king of them all in terms of fresh eating, but it's so much smaller. Um, it is very productive. It produces a lot of fruits. They always pollinate. They always produce that tree. Or I should say on that tree. But honey jar is so small that it's just not great for drying. When you dry them, there's a pit inside and you don't really get a lot of flesh. So the pit to flesh ratio on the fruits is so important. I also find, and this is the point I was trying to get to, is that things like Lee or jujubes like Lee, also Zhuzhou is another one that aren't really great eating fresh, but they're such they're so much better when you dry them that I, I really do believe that they're meant for that. That's kind of what their purpose is. They taste better like that. Um, they're larger fruits. Zuzhou is extremely, extremely productive. We talked about that, you know, just not that long ago, actually, in our other Jujube video that we did. That is a fruit that, honestly, um, I've been really impressed with. I was kind of down about it in that other video. But after this year, I had so many uh, fruits, and I've had so many fruits ever since I've had it, ever since I grafted it. Um, even the first year from graft, it's so precocious. It, it pollinates well, it produces well, uh, and then it dries well. And when you dry them, they taste so much better uh, that it's really a nice treat, I think. So for me, those are, those are really um, the four different varieties I grow to this day. I don't grow Lang anymore because of the pollination issue. Um, sugar cane, as I mentioned, is a bit smaller. It's larger than honey jar. It's relatively as early as honey jar. So both of them are very early, reliable in this climate. Um, but the sugar cane, I don't think produces as well as the honey jar. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I don't get a ton of light here and it probably needs a lot more light than where it's at. Even though this is our west side here of the property, we maybe only get, at least right now, you know, really only five or six hours of light because of the time of the year it is. But during the growing season, it's, it's not even eight hours, I don't think, here in this spot. So you really gotta be careful where you plant them. You wanna put them in the driest, warmest, sunniest spot you have. They're very, very drought tolerant. They do so well in my soil. Obviously, they've grown so well in just a very short amount of time. And I'm hoping that both of these trees will become productive again and not have this it seems like they're developing or they were developing a, a biennial habit of, you know, having a big harvest one year and then nothing the next year and then another big harvest the next year. So we'll see what happens. I think the future's bright, but those are the main differences is that you have Lee, which is the largest, then Zuzhou, then the sugar cane, then honey jar, but it's the total reverse order, I think, for fresh eating is that the smaller one, honey jar is the best, Sugarcane is the second. I would say actually Lee is a better fresh eating jujube than uh, Zuzhou actually. And then they're, they're both really good for drying as well. And they taste great. So that's mainly the varieties. I, I just wanted to discuss that after having them for so many years and trialing them and, and using them for different purposes. And, you know, I don't think this information is really that great or readily available on the internet. So I thought it would be good to, uh, to share that with you guys. Um, in terms of the trees, there's not a whole lot of difference I've noticed. They tend to like to grow upwards and it's hard to get them spreading. Whereas Lee, for some reason, maybe it's just, you know, because of how I had it in a pot and how I was growing it in a pot and how I've trimmed it over the years, it formed this much more of a spreading lateral habit to it. Um, you can kind of see what's going on down here at the base. It's, it's a bit strange. And the branches are just kind of growing sideways. Whereas I really have seen over the years of friends trees and my own trees, they like to grow up in like a triangle. So, you know, this is one side of the triangle and then the top is the, the bottom of the triangle. Um, and they tend to spread out that way having these main scaffolds eventually spread out from each other. 
Um, you don't have to prune them too much, I find. Um, although this tree over here, this lead that's really spreading, I'm gonna have to. But uh, they'll get pretty big, these trees. You know, it's not like they're gonna be small trees forever. Uh, it seems like this sugar cane particularly, especially if they don't fruit all the time, and they're just kind of, uh, you know, just gonna keep growing and not getting pollinated by their, you know, the flowers are getting pollinated, then it's gonna be much more difficult to control the size. One person did mention, I wanna talk about this, mentioned suckers. And they haven't been in the ground long enough to really realize if that is true, but there is a lot of people who will say, or at least that's the reputation of these trees, that they tend to sucker a lot. And that was my main reservation about planting them in the ground, is that you'll actually get suckers that pop up like 10 feet away from the, the actual tree. And they pop up all over the place and they're hard to get rid of and hard to deal with. To me, <laughs> it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing if that's true, which hasn't been true for me, then at least you have, uh, you know, suckers and rootstock that you could constantly graft onto. Uh, but so far, I'm not really seeing that. And I think that's just a problem typically in unhealthy trees. You know, maybe there's something wrong with the tree. It's, it's not showing, you know, good dominance as it should and suppressing that lower growth. Sometimes I find that if you don't get the entire sucker out of the ground and you leave a piece of it in there, like happens a lot with the fig trees that I grow, is that uh, it'll keep, re you know, keep restarting and keep suckering from that spot. So you gotta be careful if you are gonna take one of these suckers out of the ground. It looks like that actually is down there, the beginning of one. So if, you don't, if I don't get all that out of the ground, then it becomes a problem, I guess for the future, um, potentially. But a lot of trees sucker just in general. You know, it's not like, I don't know. To me, I don't think it's gonna be a huge issue for a lot of people. Maybe it will happen like that and it will be a problem for some of us. But in general, I don't think that should dissuade us, um, dissuade us from actually planting these trees in the ground where they really do belong. You know, I don't think they belong in a container, although I've had great success with that. That's kind of the thing. And uh, yeah, I guess the last little point here is about pollination, is I do have, you know, different flowering plants like this sedum to try to attract parasitic wasp pollinations. We also have bronze fennel that I cut back already over here. That flowers. You can also get what I typically plant uh, underneath these trees are flowering uh, alliums. Here's actually some bronze fennel down here that's coming up. We have a lot of weeds in these beds that I have not uh, kind of taken care of, but there was elephant garlic in here and different garlic and different flowering alliums that I have. It was a weird pronunciation. Um, and then of course you got comfrey, but you know, what I really want is those smaller flowers like the sedum. As a, you know, flowering allium, what that does is it, the flowers look a lot like this. It attracts the parasitic wasps. And that's what I find really is what's pollinating these trees is flies, ants, and parasitic wasps. So if you can get those great black wasps, I think they're called. I'm pretty sure that's the name of them. Or it's either big black or great black. They're huge, they're scary looking, but they don't bother you. Um, and they do the job. So I'm trying to encourage more of those wasp populations around the yard. And the only way to do that is to plant the flowering plants that give them the food. So yeah, that's kind of a look at the uh, four varieties, maybe a fifth if you count Lang that I'm growing. I'd be interested to try some others, but I think it's, you're pretty solid with just these four. If I had to choose one, I probably would choose Lee because it does taste reasonably good as a fresh eating jujube. And of course, uh, it dries well. So uh, yeah, it's got the best of both worlds, I think. Or it's got, you know, a good balance. Not the best of both worlds. But we'll see you guys soon, all right? Thanks for watching this one. Uh, check out the other videos we've done on jujubes and maybe some of the other fruits we grow. I'll see you guys for the next video. Take care.